On today's show, the Cougs head down to the Lone Star State to take on the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. The volleyball team heads down to Arizona for a weekend road trip. And the 18th ranked women's soccer team prepares for its last homestand of the season. All of that and more is coming up right now on Inside the Line. And welcome to ITL. I'm Michael Preston. And I'm Tom Gilanella. Well, let's get to the show. Oh, hello over there. Last weekend, the Cougars had about 1.6 million reasons to travel to the Alamo Dome to face the legendary Fighting Irish of Notre Dame, hoping to improve on their previous week blowout in Berkeley against the Bears. The Cougars would have to do so under extra pressure in the spotlight of a national TV audience. So let's get to the highlights and see how they did. First and 10 for the Irish on the 45, about right at the beginning of the game. Hand off to Robert Hughes, who just ran all over the Cougars all day. This time for 15 yards to Notre Dame first down. But this time the Irish in the red zone. The Cougar defense bend, don't break, Brandon Jones. Didn't defend it too well, but the important part is that pass from Jimmy Clausen, not complete. Notre Dame would tack on the first three points of the game. Well, up next, the Cougars, they went four and out. So Notre Dame with the ball again on their own 40. Now first and 10, a little farther into the first quarter. colossen has got all kinds of time, but look who's going to find him for the game's only sack. Casey Hamlet, it's about a half yard loss, but it counts. Now the Irish are going to run the Wildcat, and there's Golden Tater Tots Tate. That's right, what a nickname for Golden Tate, and he's about as good as the, those things that you serve with your taco at taco time. About a 40-yard rumble to the 20, out of the Wildcat again. This time, it's Hughes for about another 10 yards, right inside the 10-yard line for first and goal for the Irish. Or excuse me, second and six for the Irish. Clausen looking, 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 time. And there's someone they forgot in the back of the end zone. Touchdown, Notre Dame, 10-0. The Irish would go up in the first quarter, or would they? Chima Wachiku will pick up the block field goal. He'll take care of the holder and down the sideline it goes, but oh my goodness, that's a 260 pound tight end. Dan Ragone chases him down. Chima hurt on the play. He'll miss this week's game at Arizona with a bad ankle. There's Dwight Tardy, the senior showing he's still got some legs left. Into Notre Dame territory for the first time all game for the Cougars. Laguan missed the sensational softball, running like the juggernaut he is to the 35. Now second and five on Notre Dame's 11 inside the red zone tool. 50-50 ball to Jared Karstetter. He'll go up and get it for the Washington State touchdown with a buck 16 to go in the half. Momentum, maybe? You're only down 16, two possessions, maybe? Oh, this could end badly and it does. Golden Tate goes up, shows the athleticism. He'll bring it down for the touchdown. You know, it's dual possession, but that goes to the offense. Way deep into the fourth quarter now. The Cougars down 40 to seven, and there it is. Karstetter again with a touchdown catch. His second catch of the day, both of them went for touchdowns, and the Cougars lost 40 to 14 down in San Antonio. So that was, you know, I, they improved on certain aspects. I think the defense played exceptionally well flying around the field, but the offense just needs to, not a good game plan on the offense, but I thought they did at least all right. They did okay, but there were a lot of times, at least in the bits and pieces I saw in this game on TV, that Notre Dame just made it look way too easy. And yeah. I think that's because of the Cougars' size up front on both sides of the ball. It's, but really, you can't take too much out of this game and the rest of the season other than this team is a long ways to go. Yep. Well, Halloween on Halloween weekend, the Cougars volleyball team faced an upset minded Arizona State team. The Sun Devils came up with an early treat as they knocked off the 21st-ranked Cougars three games to one. The defeat was followed by another tough loss when the 18th-ranked Arizona Wildcats tricked the Cougs three to one on Halloween. The Cougs, now ranked 24th, look to bounce back at home this weekend versus number 13 Cal on Friday and number six Stanford on Saturday. Both games are scheduled for 7 p.m. At, in Bowler Gymnasium. Last week again, the Cougar soccer team traveled down to Oregon. They have got no sales tax there. That's awesome. To play the Beavers and the Ducks. 
First, it was the Beavers to run into the 18th ranked Washington State Cougars. The game was scoreless until the 40th minute when Kirsten Dahlstream put a shot off the post and Brandy Vega was there to finish the only goal of the game and the Cougars will take the Beavs 1-0. Now the Ducks were next up on the Cougar plate and they had no plans of going home without the sweep. Allie Fenter with the first goal of the game and Carly DeBrads doubled the lead a minute and 20 seconds later, sealing the sweep for the Cougs with a win 2-0. This weekend, the Cougars will close out their regular season with two big home games. First, they have the 21st ranked USC Trojans on Friday at 1.30, and then it gets very difficult on Sunday, the UCLA Bruins, 11 a.m. Well, it pains me to read this next story, but the New York Yankees took home the fall classic title Wednesday night in the Bronx. The Yanks clinched with a 7-3 victory in Game 6. Andy Pettit got the win. Hideki Matsui won the World Series MVP, mainly due to the single-game World Series record tying uh, six RBIs in the clincher. It was a night for records as Andy Pettit became the first pitcher in the wild card era since 1995 to start and win the clinching game of all three postseason series in the same year. The World Series championship is the Yankees' 27th of their franchise's story history, 17 more titles in the St. Louis Cardinals, who are second in all-time World Series titles. Well, I think you've had enough of us, so now we're going to toss it to Nero Threet, who's hosting Face Off for us. Nero? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Face Off. I'm Nero Threet, and with me tonight is defending champion Jeff McNish and his challenger, Julia Burton. There's a lot going on in the sports world right now, so let's get to it. Was the NCAA's suspension of Oklahoma State standout wide receiver Des Bryant for the rest of the season too heavy of a penalty? Kick us off, Julia. All right, I think it was way too heavy of a penalty. Um, all he did was meet Deion Sanders for a little lunch and take a jog. I really don't think it's that big of a deal. And we all know NCAA players have done much worse. And um, I don't think we should put all of the pressure or you know all of this blame on Bryant and maybe more of Deion Sanders because he's he's been doing you know he played football for years. He should know better. And you know there a source close to Bryant said that he had. Uh, Sanders has been sending Bryant inspirational text messages almost every day. He should know better if he knows he's not allowed to talk to him or meet up with him. Of course, you know, you're a college football player. You're going to want to meet up with a, you know, it's just too much temptation, and Sanders should have known better. Yeah, you're not going to refuse a meeting with prime time, that's for sure. I mean, Deion Sanders is great, and I think it was definitely too heavy. And what I find most interesting is the NCAA just has no consistency with suspensions. Like, it's just, there's no governing body that's controlling all the systems. You look at Garrett Blunt, he got suspended.